Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Today I'm talking about six reasons you may not necessarily be right or correct. If it's found in the Word of God, it's right. But you know what? Sometimes we can't find every answer in the Word of God. We need to depend on the Holy Spirit, the direction and power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about that today, how to find out if you're right according to the Word of God, how to know when you're right outside of the Word of God. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello, welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to be with you today. And I'm even speaking mainly to ministers today, but I'm going to apply it to every one of you. And uh, those of you listening may think, well, my pastor fits into this too. I think I'll just take this to him and talk to him about it. And uh, that's what we'll be talking with today. And I actually am coming from my book on Leadership Secrets of David the King. And this is a very short psalm, Psalm 131. And in that very short psalm, uh, David brings out four different types and four different directions of looking at leadership. And so uh, this little short psalm, which again is a very short psalm, uh, that's one I used to memorize whenever they'd ask us. You know, in, in youth department, they want us to memorize a chapter out of the Bible. I'd always head back to those psalms of degrees, those little short psalms. And this is one of them that I would uh, memorize. Of course, I never knew what impact was in that. I just memorized it as it was. But this book is built all around. Look at look how thick the book is. Okay, that's one book uh, directed around one three uh, verse uh, psalm, Psalm 131. That'd be a great blessing to you. So the announcer's going to come on at halftime, tell you how you can have a copy of this all for yourself. And it'll be a great blessing. Look at Proverbs chapter 21. I want you to look there with me. I'm going to talk today about uh, reasons you're not necessarily right. And uh, this not only applies to ministers, but many people I know. And actually, we're going to take a look at another verse of Scripture here in just a moment in Proverbs 12 that says, Fools think their own way is right. And uh, anyone who thinks they have the right way on everything is arrogant. This is what it really is. In essence, you're competing with God who, again, everything with God is right, and yet God is humble when he talks about it. But if you think you're right in every single respect, well, move over Godhead. We now have the fourth member. It's this guy. But again, the word of God declares you're a fool if you think that everything that you do is right. Proverbs 21 and verse two says this, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. That's why you make decisions. And it's all right to think inside yourself, I'm making a right decision. If you're willing to find out one day, if you're wrong, you'll admit it. And so it's not the fact that, uh, you know, you never make mistakes. It's the fact that when you do, you own up to it. And this is what the Word of God is full of, is simply that we need to think we're right. In fact, we study, we do things that we think is right. We take a step thinking we're right. But if we ever find out we're wrong, we admit it. And there's times even as a minister that I had to stand in front of my congregation and tell them, I used to teach it this way. Now I'm teaching it this way. I have studied it, restudied it. Someone, some minister, some book, some CD opened up my eyes and I saw it from a different viewpoint, came back and looked at it again. You know what, congregation? I was wrong. So I'm going to take it from here and I'm going to start teaching it right. And that's important that you be able to do that. And so Proverbs 21, 2 says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. That is correct. But then Proverbs 12 and verse 15 says, fools think their way is right. And literally what it means is only their way is right and that you don't need to question them because everything they do is right. When I went back uh, for my uh, uh, high school reunion, there was a young man that was in there. His father was a very well-known attorney in town, and he was very proud of his father. And so one day in class, we were talking about things. The, the teacher talked about something, and he said something. With the, at the moment, I thought, that, that can't be right. I didn't know why. I was young at the time. Now that I look back at it, I know why it was wrong. And the teacher said something about we all need to learn this stuff. And, and this boy raised his hand and said, my father is a self-made man. And so it kind of got quiet in there. And what he was simply saying was, my dad does it right. And no one has helped my dad. And so I didn't think about that at the time, but later on I did think about it. When I went back from my reunion, I saw him. I didn't say anything to him, but I looked at him. I thought, you know what? I have the answer for you now. Your dad didn't birth himself. He didn't feed himself. He didn't change his own diapers. 
He didn't educate himself. He didn't teach himself English. He did not teach himself any other language. He didn't teach himself law. All the things you're talking about, he needed someone else in life to instruct him. And even now, I bet you he's had to change his mind on certain things. He's not right in everything he does. This verse says again in Proverbs 12, and verse 15, fools think their way is right. The thing about it is, is we're not only surrounded by fools everywhere, but often in the ministry we have fools. Fools who think that their way is the only way. They have now discovered the right way to do everything. And because of certain indicators, they think everybody should flock to them to find out how to do it correctly. And I'm here to let you know there's correctness in different areas of life that aren't the same everywhere. In other words, what's correct in a, um, let's just say a moderate area of town where you have middle income people as opposed to those in poverty areas. There's just certain ways you do things in one area that you can't do another way. It's simply talking about that there's certain way that you handle uh, life toward a woman as toward a man, toward old, toward young. In other words, there's just certain things you do that you learn to adapt to certain areas. There's not just one way that settles everything unless it's the plan of salvation, period. Unless it's the way to please God, period. There's certain things when it comes to spiritual areas of life that it's just done one way. But on the other hand, there's also areas even in the in the spiritual life, such as ministering in a church, having a church. Who are you ministering to? Uh, what's the problems in their life that you have to really adapt yourself and come up with ways and thank God for the Holy Spirit that can show you when you are blind at the moment and you're like walking in darkness is exactly what to do. Thank God for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there were times in Paul's ministry he didn't know what to say and God gave him how to speak to a certain individual, how to speak to a certain business leader, how to speak to a certain government leader. These are things that Paul, Peter, others of the New Testament depending on the Holy Spirit, we're able to minister. I think of uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He had never heard that sermon before. He stood up and the power of the Holy Spirit gave him an entire sermon, which is one of the three best of the entire book of Acts and he was his sermon was number one, and later on we had the sermon in, in a chapter six, where uh, to the people in the streets, I mean, it was presented from a deacon in the church. And later on we have in Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, we have these three different sermons appearing there, and Peter's is one of them. And I think the other two must have been practiced, must have been looked at, must have been studied. But in this case, Paul just stood up on the day of Pentecost, and this thing was handed to him by the Holy Spirit. But he spoke to people in the streets, and thank God for a word of knowledge that can come at certain times because you can't make one method of witnessing correct in every case. You can't make one case, one way of just counseling people with marriage problems. The Holy Spirit has to be able to open up your heart and show you individual cases what's going on so you can have the wisdom from the Word of God on how to handle it. In other words, you are not always right. One way of doing things doesn't settle always. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the gifts of the Spirit. That's why we have the word of God to where in a time where you're facing difficulty on how to handle this situation, the Holy Spirit can show you the right direction for this person. I think of the woman at the well. When the woman at the well was challenging Jesus on some things, he said, you're right that, you know, this man is not your husband. In fact, you've had five men before this and none of, and, and, and they were your husbands, but now the one you're living with is not your husband. And she said, you must be a prophet. In other words, he knew how to get right to her by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When speaking to Nathaniel, Jesus said, Nathaniel, I saw you sitting under a tree. That's what really got to him. He knew how in that case to specifically direct it toward a person. So again, I come back to it. You are not necessarily right in every situation. God will instruct you and tell you. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12 says this, now we see into a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. This is in heaven. Now I know in part, but then I will know even as I am known. In other words, when I get to heaven, I'll know everything, but right now I only know in part. Every person has to admit this. And sometimes the hardest ones to admit it is ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who pastor churches, those who have ministries themselves. And sometimes as your ministry gets large, you suddenly think you have the answer for everything. I actually heard a minister in a meeting one time saying, all you guys can get off television. My television show now goes worldwide and we don't need yours anymore. He actually said this to a whole, you know, 
auditorium full of people and everybody had the same idea, who is this guy? My, my broadcast ministers to different people than his ministers to because his had a great evangelistic thrust. There'll be others that are teachers there. It comes back to it, God needs us all. When a person thinks he knows everything, he becomes arrogant and haughty. First Corinthians chapter eight and verse one says this, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, it edifies. Arrogance is what I'm talking about here, and arrogance is exaggerated self-esteem. What am I saying? Arrogance is wrong, but self-esteem is okay. But taking it to the extreme is what turns it into arrogance. God loves self-esteem. He wants you to love yourself, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. It's all right to love yourself, but you need to love your neighbor as much, if not more, at times, and then love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and then your neighbor is yourself. But arrogance is exaggerated self-esteem. Arrogance takes all the credit for knowledge and accomplishments. Like I talked about that one young guy in high school that his father was an attorney. He said his father basically knew everything and didn't need to be taught anything, and he was even self-taught himself. Confidence gives credit and recognition to many others who helped you along the path that you were going on. Teachers that helped just had a certain way of teaching. I have a teacher that uh, when she taught, I took typing when I was in, in uh, junior high, didn't know I would be good at it, but she opened up something in me I'd never seen and just talked to the class and I immediately took it, ran with it, and typing became one of the, the most favorite things I had in my life when I did my own books. And then later on, of course, when keypads came out and we have computers today. So again, confidence inside of you gives credit, but also recognition to many other people. We really never know enough until we recognize that God alone knows everything. Knowledge should also show us how much we don't know. In fact, the more you know, the more you find out you don't know. Being human, we can only receive infinite truth in finite doses. And sometimes those finite doses aren't totally correct and we have to correct them so we can keep on going to another level. But again, we are human. And in our humanity, we can be we can miss things. We can uh, not know what we're doing. We can have ignorance at times, but thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the word of God. And again, thank God that we can be corrected and still grow in the things of God. I want to talk to pastors. I speak in so many churches in different places, and usually arrogance is not something I run across that often. Most pastors I know are humble, open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, look to find other ways to be a blessing to their congregation, read after other ministers, but also search the word of God for answers in there that they may be missing in their own life. And even I appreciate when churches are doing well and pastors are doing well that they still say, I can do better. It simply shows no matter how good I do, I have not arrived to God's level yet and will not until one day I'm in heaven, have a resurrection body, and even then I think we'll be learning forever when we get to heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 18 says this, when people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend you. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, this is in the Amplified, some who exalt themselves gives testimony for themselves. If some people love to talk about themselves and their accomplishments, it simply comes back to this because they have love for self more than love for anybody else. We'll continue this when we come back from the break, and I want you to be sure and get a copy for yourself of Leadership Secrets of David the King. Godly promotion seems always to come in steps. Slow growth allows us to learn valuable lessons on the way up, so once we reach the top, we can stay there and truly enjoy the benefits of success. It took many years from the time that David was anointed king until he became king of Israel. Those who advance too quickly because of their own efforts and talents often find the descent quicker than the ascent. Pastor Bob Yandian has based this book, Leadership Secrets of David the King, on Psalm 131, which reveals the secrets of David's successful leadership that he learned while ruling as king over Israel. To order The Leadership Secrets of David the King, visit bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption 
justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Many churches today, pastors are in the pulpit, and they think that many of them think that what they're doing is the right way to do it. And not only that, they think it's the right way to do it because they got it from someone else that they think is doing it the right way. And they have many ways of judging that, size of the church, success of the church, uh, you know, the, the feeling when you walk into the church, the results that the church is getting in the community and in, the, in our own country and even sometimes around the world. And so this becomes the standard they look at. And listen, honestly, what works in one church may not work in your church. The people may be different in your area of the country. And those who live in rural areas, you don't treat them the same as people that live in large cities. Again, there's certain ways we do it, but the one common denominator we do have is to teach the Word of God. And sadly, in many churches today, the Word of God is not being taught. We have life lessons. And what I mean by that is they'll give stories and then they'll pull a scripture in to help support that, when really it should be the other way around. What we should be teaching is the Word of God and once in a while, I'll throw in a story that shows you how that, that particular area of the Word of God worked in your life. And so we get it from other ministers, and oftentimes you listen to a sermon, and and 80% of the sermon is just stories and stories. My kids did this, and in school we learned this. And then they'll apply a scripture to that, and people walk out thinking they've heard the word of God. No, actually, they've heard more about you than they have the word of God. And Jesus, again, didn't even bring out stories about himself. He just brought out lessons about life, but he threw them in to help people understand the scripture. What came and what was most important was the scripture, not the story. Story. The story only in his case is called parables. We're not even true stories. It's just general examples of what happens in life around us, but help to explain the word of God. In fact, he taught the word of God and then finally would throw in a parable. This is what it should be today, is that the main thing we teach is the word of God from the pulpit and once in a while throw in something from life to help people understand how that this thing really can be seen by things we see around us and what Jesus and what Paul and what Peter were really trying to tell us. So again, the scriptures that I was looking at just before the break was 2 Corinthians 10, 18. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is the Lord's commending us, not ourselves. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, some who exalt themselves gives testimony for themselves. And this is what we're talking about. They use themselves as examples and not the word of God. And honestly, I think one of the best things to do is if you teach something from the New Testament, bring out an Old Testament story. Because those stories are there to help us understand the New Testament. This is all found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the Old Testament was given to us for examples and examples of the things we walk in today. You know, here in Tulsa, many churches have begun through the years. I had a church in Tulsa. We were very successful, but I did not want to make us the example. In fact, one person stood up in church one time and said, thus said the Lord God has set thee as a, a light on a hill to show other churches the right way to do it. And I stopped him. I stopped this guy and told him, don't say that God does not take prophecy and build up one church above all others. I said, I have found what works in this area. I've taken the word of God. I've applied it, but anyone else can do the same thing in some other city. How you would build a church perhaps in California as opposed to New York, as opposed to the deep south are a little bit different in every case. And you simply, again, learn the people that you're working with and apply the word of God to them. Many churches, again, like I said, begin some with good, some with godly motives and some without godly motives. Those with godly motives succeeded and many of them remain in the city today. Those with personal ambitions often began well, but lost 
lost their influence and eventually closed. We even had one church that came to Tulsa and bragged on the fact that other churches had not found the way to revival, but God was going to come and use them and show us the right way to find revival. Well, that church didn't last very long. In fact, there were some people from our church that wanted to go there. I just warned them before they go. I said, I'm not going to stop you from going, but I can tell you this is what you're going to find. And that's an arrogance over the church like we are the church to show everyone else how to do it. And you know what? Within a number of weeks, those people came back and said, that's exactly what I saw. Let's take six wrong assumptions about being right. Number one, I am right because my church or my following is large. Every pastor wants a large number of members coming, but we don't like to see empty seats. And numbers don't necessarily indicate that you're right on every issue or every doctrine. I tell people this, ministers especially, that, that oftentimes they preach to the empty seats or about the empty seats. And they actually get on to the people who came for the people who didn't come. Listen, preach to the full seats, not the empty seats. Don't preach to the full seats about the empty seats. Thank those who came, got up early, got their kids dressed, brought them to church, thanked them for coming. And perhaps if you thank them for coming, they'll tell other people about the church. But if you just constantly get on to them about the empty seats, they may not come back because they'll say, well, I got up, I came, I wasn't even appreciated. I was actually ran down for not filling the empty seats. A present day minister said, I must be right. Look how many people are following my ministry. Well, I can tell you this, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all have large followings. It doesn't make their teachings and it doesn't make their places of worship correct. On the other hand, number two is this, I'm right because my church is small. And this is based on the assumption that all large churches compromise their beliefs in the word or the power of the Holy Spirit. I must be ministering to the remnant, the chosen ones, or the true believers. Home churches are what we need to return to where we don't have that much room and we just have lots and lots of small churches. Well, there are great churches and unhealthy churches of which some are large and some are small. So again, healthy churches, unhealthy churches, some large, some small. Jesus' crowd fluctuated quickly between large and small. And there was a time, one time, when even large crowds followed him and he came and he turned and spoke to them and most of them left. And Jesus wasn't hurt at all, even told his disciples, are you gonna leave too? Jesus even tried to reduce the size of his following through that challenge I talked about. And the challenge had to do with personal growth. Oftentimes people come to church and they like the crowd. It makes them feel like this is important. And so they stick around for a while until personal growth is brought to them. And that's when they start heading for the door. And yet Jesus often challenged empty churches to do this, go into the highways and alleyways and compel men to come in that my house may be full. God likes a house that's full, but he wants you to preach the truth to them, not the fact that they must be in the right place simply because there's a large crowd that's there. Crowds do not indicate success. The third one is this, I must be right because my church is popular. This is somewhat similar to the size issue. The buzz around town is not necessarily based on fact, but opinion. Slick marketing, catchy slogans, clever PR doesn't make a good church. In fact, in Mark chapter one and verse 28, speaking of Jesus' ministry, his fame spread throughout all the regions around Galilee. And this was because of he taught the truth and because he had signs and wonders. If you go with the word of God, ministers, if you go with the truth of the Holy Spirit and you depend on the truth of the Holy Spirit and you preach the truth from the word of God, then the people will come and they'll come for the right reason and they'll stick for the right reason. But if everything you do has to do with catchy slogans, again, slick marketing, all these other things to bring people in, when they come in, they'll see that the church itself doesn't match up to what they have heard and they'll leave because of that. Although Jesus became popular, he built his ministry on truth and substance and not opinion. What somebody said one time was focus on the steak and not the sizzle. You know, sometimes we come to church because of all the sizzle, but there's really no steak there. There's no meat underneath all that sizzle. It's just fun. It's just exciting. When people leave, that's all they remember is the exciting time that they were there. Number four is this. I must be right because my church is being persecuted. 
Well, you may be persecuted because your doctrine is so far off and your methods are controversial or your morals are out of line. Again, oftentimes, I've heard this before, there was a minister that was caught in adultery and some four or five women over a time period that they had slept with. And whenever it came out, they said, I'm just being persecuted. Well, you should be persecuted if your morals are that far out of line. And Jesus even brought it up when their morals were out of line. Look at chapter five of 1 Corinthians with Paul, who had to get onto a church for allowing a man to stay in the church who was sleeping with his stepmother. I mean, how far out of line can you get the that. When others don't concur, then you begin to play the martyr. Well, they persecuted Jesus and the prophets, and I'm in good company. Your attitude is, if you don't agree with me, then you're persecuting me, and that is strictly not true. In other words, we're disagreeing with you because you do not agree with the Word of God, and you do not agree with the principles of morality that even goes with a minister, even if that pastor is not preaching exactly the word as we think he should, we're often happy when his morals are right. And at least he shows a godliness through his lifestyle. What's even worse is when you preach godliness, but you don't live it. And that's often what we see in the pulpit today. So it comes back to it again. Just because you are being persecuted doesn't mean that you are in the right and that you are following the, the Lord correctly. Number five is this, I am right because my church is wealthy. Financial gain is great, and we all like to see financial gain. In fact, the Word of God teaches that if we'll follow after God, there is financial gain that comes with it. But God is always wanting to check your intentions, your motives behind why you want the finances not to just heap on yourself or buy great things for yourself or have your church be the finest thing in the city to, to look at. And all, although those things can be okay, if again, you're out to bless your people and you're not out to just build a kingdom for yourself. Financial gain is not necessarily godliness. We'll find this, 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul said, for those who preach that financial gain is godliness, turn away from that. Godliness is not in how much money you have. It's in your life with God, your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that morality that's in you that comes from wanting to serve God and showing the community that God makes a change in your life. For those who teach that gain is godliness, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul said, turn away from this type of teaching. John said of the church at Laodicea, you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. He says, you don't know that you're wretched and miserable, you're poor, you're blind and naked. This is found in Revelation 3, 17. Your church may be rich because you teach the word of God and its blessings, but the glory still goes to God, not to you. Number six is this, I'm right because my church is poor. Well, poverty is not necessarily godliness either. Based on the crowds and location, income can vary, and a minister's life is marked by times of plenty and also by times of lack. Philippians 4.12, I know how to live on very little, and I know how to live on a lot. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, a full stomach or an empty stomach, in times of plenty or in times of little. You know, Jesus wasn't more right when the crowds were growing than when the crowds were shrinking. And Paul wasn't more right when finances were good than when finances were tight. The same thing is true in our kingdom today and with our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your motives be correct. Keep it in line with the word of God and expect the crowds to come because the Holy Spirit draws them or your people go out full of excitement for the right reason and bring in the crowds into the church. Have a great time. We'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.